very important uh, that we get together and talk about this kind of stuff um, as often as possible because I think there's a lot that is missed when reading the media and when discussing topics such as U.S. foreign policy with regards to Iran, there's a lot of deliberate misinformation that's disseminated so that people like ourselves don't know what's actually going on, don't know what our government is actually doing, and don't know what the basic facts are that are being discussed in these articles or in speeches given by politicians or on cable news shows by pundits, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, so the more we, we talk about it, even if we disagree, I think is, uh, is very, very important uh, because it serves to open the debate that is, that is vitally needed. Um, I will hopefully keep this uh, moderately brief, um, especially because, like yourselves, I'm, I'm very excited to hear what Phyllis has to say. Um, but I'd like to start by quoting a little from a news report from uh, The Independent, which is a, which is a British paper. Um, I think you'll recognize the, the tone of this report. An arms deal with the United States that will give Israel 25 of the most sophisticated fighter bombers in the world with a range of 3,600 miles has slid through Congress with no objections by legislators and virtually no comment in the American media. This article discusses twin-engined aircraft that would enable the Israelis to carry out strikes deep into enemy territory without even having to refuel. The report goes on. The U.S., which is known to be worried about the development of weapons of mass destruction in the region, particularly weapons of nuclear capability by Iran, appears to be reappointing Israel as the local deputy sheriff. That report was written in 1994. Very little has changed except that this government has bombed the two countries that's that on, on either side of Iran. And there are many who believe that another war is coming. War. Um, I happen not to be one of those people. I, I don't think uh, Israel or the United States has the capability uh, or even the will to carry out such a disastrous policy as attacking Iran, which unlike Afghanistan and Iraq, did not spend decades beset by complete devastation and, uh, and, and sanctions. I mean, now there have been sanctions, but not of the stripe of Iraq that served to kill about half a million Iraqi children. However, warmongering continues and it persists and there's a reason for it. And the reason, I believe, is not because a strike is actually imminent. We've been hearing these warnings for decades. We've also been hearing that Iran is this close to having a nuclear weapon for 30 years. <laughs> the purposes of, of such warmongering, of such fearmongering, of such disinformation is to set up a situation where, where Iran might face the US hopes and Israel hopes um, a policy of regime change, which can't come from a military strike. It is the hope of this government and the government of Israel as well as some others that to make life so miserable in Iran will serve to turn the people of Iran against their own government and create a mass uprising. I believe this to be a ridiculous thought because Outside influence imposing these situations on Iran will certainly not create a situation where the Iranian people will start blaming their own government for what the United States is clearly doing to them. 
But beyond all this, we still hear all this disinformation, all this, all this, uh, Iran has a nuclear weapons program, the president said this, etc., etc. However, sometimes a little truth actually gets in. This, this past March, just a few months ago, Reuters released a special report, a very, very large article about um, the Iranian nuclear program. It was entitled, Intel shows Iran nuclear threat not imminent. Reuters. The article started, the United States, European allies, and even Israel generally agree on three things about Iran's nuclear program. Tehran does not have a bomb, has not decided to build one, and is probably years away from having a deliverable nuclear warhead. It continues, those conclusions drawn from extensive interviews with current and former US and European officials with access to intelligence on Iran contrast starkly with the heated debate surrounding a possible Israeli strike on Tehran's nuclear facilities. Now, what are some of these, these points that we keep hearing? We hear, obviously, that Iran is actively building nuclear weapons, despite the fact that the intelligence agencies of this country and other countries know that that's not true and repeatedly tell us that that's not true. Defense Secretary Leon Panetta, Joint Chiefs of Staff, Chairman Martin Dempsey, Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, Director of, uh, Director of Defense Intelligence Agency, Ronald Burgess, as well as the IDF Chief of Staff in Israel, Benny Gantz, Mossad Head Tamir Pardo, among others, consistently say that Iran does not have a nuclear weapons program. We hear that Iran, in the past, in the past few years, has enriched enough uranium for five nuclear bombs. What, what never follows that statement is that this enriched uranium is nowhere close to weapons grade. It is only a much lower enrichment level that can be used either for powering nuclear power plants or creating medical isotopes for cancer patients. Also, if this stockpiled uranium were to be further enriched, the, the mere action of attempting to start doing that would be immediately recognized by the, uh, by the IAEA, by the International Atomic Energy Agency, which monitors 24 hours a day the Iranian nuclear program. We hear, obviously, repeated over and over again, that the president of Iran has threatened to wipe Israel off the map, despite the fact that by now we should all know that that's a misrepresentation, that's a, 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 a mistranslated misrepresentation, a misinterpreted quote, routinely repeated out of context and left incomplete, that has long been debunked by anyone actually paying attention. The quote itself, not to belabor the point, is that the Israeli government will not be a long-lasting government. One can disagree with that statement. But the issue has, to, has nothing to do with the military strike. He said, as the Soviet Union disappeared, the Zionist regime will also vanish. That's not a military threat. What we keep hearing is that this is a existential threat against the state of Israel. Despite the fact that in repeated, repeated interviews over the past six years, six, seven years, it has been reaffirmed by Iranian officials that their solution to the situation in Israel and Palestine is a referendum so that, quote, Jews, Christians, and Muslims of the population of Palestine can select their own government and destiny for themselves in a democratic manner. Now, of course, coming from Iran, you may find that to be disingenuous. But again, that's what is actually said. Nevertheless, that singular phrase, the wiped off the map phrase, 
and all the implications and fear-mongering that have deliberately come with it have found its way into upwards of 50 congressional resolutions condemning Iran as an aggressive, genocidal, existential threat to a state that was deliberately built upon ethnic cleansing, colonization, and continued military occupation, which itself has hundreds of actual nuclear weapons at its disposal, the means to deliver them, and the backing of the world's only superpower as its dutiful benefactor. That's us, by the way. We hear consistently that Iran is sponsoring terrorism around the world, despite the fact that just in the past few months, our own media here has revealed what many people knew for a long time, but has, has essentially confirmed that the US government and Israel's secret service, the Mossad, have been financing, training, and arming Iranian terrorist groups within Iran, training them sometimes here in Nevada to murder Iranian scientists, to carry out assassinations of Iranian government officials, and killing Iranian women and children. We hear that, obviously, Iran is a threat to us and everyone we hold dear, despite the fact that the Iranian military spending is about 2% of what we spend here. And it's not occupying other countries. Beyond all this, we hear that Iran, in terms, of, in terms of its nuclear program, must meet its international obligations, lest they deal with the, the drastic consequences. Despite the fact that such obligations are, are rarely actually defined, we just hear that they're intransigent and, and, and mean. And when, when these obligations are actually defined, sometimes in terms of they have to suspend their uranium enrichment program and allow IAEA inspectors access to facilities that are not actually covered in their legal safeguards agreement with that agency. These obligations actually wind up ignoring international law and specifically abrogate Iran's inalienable national rights as affirmed under its membership in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty to which Iran has been a signatory for over four decades. And Israel's never signed it. In addition to this, we never hear that Iran voluntarily implemented the additional protocol to the IAEA. It's an it's a enhanced inspection regime where the agency can go into uh, undeclared sites, can go pretty much wherever it wants to determine that there is no nuclear weapons program and that all nuclear uh, facilities are, are, are maintained for only peaceful purposes. Iran voluntarily implemented this protocol for nearly two years between late 2003 and 2005, during which no evidence whatsoever was ever found of a nuclear weapons program. At the end of all this, we, uh, we hear that sanctions are working, these sanctions that have been imposed on the Iranian people for decades now and are only increasing. There was a report today in the Los Angeles Times saying that sanctions are, are about to get a whole lot worse. On July 1st, uh, a European embargo of Iranian oil is set to go into effect, for example. But we hear that they're working. Now what does that mean? They don't have a nuclear weapons program. So, so what, are we, what are we sanctioning them for? We hear, for example, from Nick Kristof, the columnist for the New York Times, who just returned to the States from like a three-week trip or something to Iran, where he was given access to uh, do whatever he wanted. He, he took a road trip around Iran, unescorted. And he, he, he recently wrote last week that, uh, Sanctions are working there. And continued to say, this is, this is Christoph, I regret this suffering. And let's be clear that sanctions are hurting ordinary Iranians more than senior officials. I'm also appalled that the West blocks sales of airline parts, thus risking crashes of civilian aircraft. Yet, Christoph continues, 
with apologies to the many wonderful Iranians who showered me with hospitality. I favor sanctions because I don't see any other way to pressure this regime on the nuclear issue or ease its grip on power. My takeaway is that sanctions are working pretty well. Now again, there is no nuclear weapons program in Iran, which pretty much means that the only purpose of current US policy of sanctioning and sanctioning and threatening and sanctioning and threatening is meant to scare the Iranian population so much into thinking that these horrible things are befalling them, because they are, that they will turn against their own government. Despite the fact that even with these decades of sanctions, Iran has had a higher annual growth since 2007 than both the United States and Europe. Despite these sanctions, the Iranian government has curtailed, has, has drawn back uh, government subsidies on various items at a time when their oil-rich neighbors, quizzling Arab dictatorships beholden to U.S. interests, were making massive welfare payments to their own public designed to try and stave off unrest and revolution. I feel like here in this country, we think that Iranian and American history relations began on November 4th, 1979, the day that revolutionary students seized control of the US Embassy in Tehran. That's where everything starts for people here. So there's a vendetta, there's an embarrassment. But what that completely ignores deliberately is the context of the CIA overthrow of the Mossadegh government in 1953 and the quarter century of brutal dictatorship under the Shah, a regime of torture and corruption, tyranny. And this is what we hear. We hear that this, this terrible thing happened to these innocent 52 American diplomats. And they were held for 444 days for absolutely no reason, and this is what Iran is. When the reality is, as a, actually an Associated Press report from January 10, 1980 told us, that Iranian militants who were holding these, these hostages say that they will not release them until the Shah is returned to Iran to stand trial on charges of corruption and other crimes, including torture by the Sabak. The article continued that the Iranian government has demanded an international hearing of its grievances against the Shah and his former government. Now what we've just witnessed in Egypt with the overthrow of a US-backed dictator Imagine if Mubarak got medical treatment here in the United States and was not returned to Egypt for trial to be prosecuted for his regime and the crimes that it committed. How would the Egyptians react? I'm not saying that taking over an embassy is maybe what I would do, but I wouldn't be happy at all. And it would be a real breach of any sort of any sort, sort sort of justice that can come after a dictatorship, and so I think I'll leave it at there at, at at that. And I know that that was kind of a lot, but <laughs> but I think it's important to realize what we're faced with on a daily basis in terms of what we hear about Iranians, what we hear about Iran and and its government, what we hear about the nuclear program. Um, and these perceptions and this demonization and dehumanization is so persistent and so pervasive that it sets up a situation, I don't know if you heard, where a number of Apple computer stores down in Georgia the other week refused to sell an iPad to a customer because they heard her speaking Farsi. Refused to sell a piece of merchandise to an individual simply because of the language that she was speaking. 
When asked why she couldn't buy this iPad, she was told by the representative at the Apple store, well, you know, we don't have very good relations with, with Iran, and uh, because of the sanctions, I'm not allowed to sell this to you. Now, not only is that not true, but that creates, th th this is evidence of what we're seeing, that, that three decades of this persistent warmongering, persistent, um, persistent demonization. This is what it produces, and it produces a situation where the public in this country is, is just one step away from supporting another disastrous military endeavor, which again, I don't think will ever happen. But it sets up a situation where regime change winds up being the alternative to military action, which is a false choice. It's either, well, you're going to bomb them, or we have to, we have to influence their, their own sovereignty. So I will leave it there. Sorry for talking too long. And uh, thanks for listening, everyone.